Good morning, West Wilmington, and happy Sabbath. I'd like to welcome you to our virtual worship broadcast to you today from the Harrison home. And on behalf of Pastor Elvis McGoy and Pastor Josue Feliciano, I'd like to welcome all of you who have chosen to join us today uh, from the comfort of your home. We pray that you are safe. We pray that your needs are being provided for. And as we enter into our season of worship, just allow us to take a moment to pray. Our Father and God in heaven, we're grateful to you for this Sabbath day. We're thankful for the privilege we have of worship, even in these perilous times. God, we pray for your presence. We pray for your peace. We pray for your will to be done for Christ's name's sake. Amen. Hi, I want to take a few moments at the beginning of our programming today to give you a few updates with regards to our nominating committee process. Earlier on this year, we were able to vote a team that by the grace of God being led by the Holy Spirit, they had a task to undertake, and that is to nominate leaders for this church, West Wilmington Seventh-day Adventist, for the period of 2020 through 2022. I want first of all to commend all the team members because they have been working extra hard. And although the work is not done, they definitely have been doing their best to meet on a weekly basis to be sure that this process goes forward. And for that, please receive thank you on my behalf and for Pastor Josue as well, and on behalf of the congregation. For every single West Wilmington church member out there, we want you to know that this process for this year will be unique in its own way for you to receive the name of the nominees. It is important for me to state that this does not set the precedence 
for how our voting will have to take place in the future. It is simply because we are going through an unusual time that we are going to take an unusual step in how we do the voting process. Here is what you need to know with regards to that. Number one, the voting process is mainly and primarily for the West Wilmington Seventh-day Adventist Church members. Number two, the way we are going to communicate the names of those who have been nominated for leadership will be one, via email, and number two, you're also going to receive mail in case you do not do email. For that reason, if you are listening to this broadcast, you have email capabilities as a member of West Wilmington Church, but you have not received the church email. Please go ahead and submit an email to our communication director and the email is as you see here below you are loved 1208 at aol.com if you are not receiving email or you know someone who is not receiving email then you want to be sure that you can also receive that information via mail here is how the process will go we have already sent out the first email for you to be able to go through. We kindly ask you to prayfully review the names that have been submitted. In the event that you have any reservation, please feel free to contact me directly. My phone number is as you see on the side, but also you can also reach Pastor Josue on his phone number as well. Your concern or reservations are not to be expressed via email. If you have any concern, we kindly ask you to call and reach out to us directly for us to have that conversation and see how to support and give credit to your concerns. If by the date of May 30th, we have not had any reservations, then as a church body, we will accept that as your vote to approve these leaders to be able to go into effect. And so once again, I reiterate, this is not the precedence for how we are going to be voting, but it is mainly because of the current circumstances. Once again, if you have any reservation on any of the names, please call me directly on my phone number or call Pastor Josue directly. The reservations or concerns are not to be expressed via email. And if we do not hear of any reservations by May 30th, we will accept that as your vote for us to move forward with these leaders. May God bless you as we journey together in our worship service today, but also during this season. Be blessed. Good morning and happy Sabbath, all of our brethren at West Wilmington Church. It's been a long time since we had this opportunity to worship with you because we were sick with coronavirus. But thank God this morning we are strong, we are well, and we are rejoicing in God. And we are so glad to lift our voices in praise. And glad that you will have that chance to do so with us. We believe, especially in the light of all that we are seeing, that Christ is soon to return. That it's almost time for the Lord to come. That is why we would like to begin this time of praise and worship with the hymn, "'Tis almost time for the Lord to come." <laughs> Oh 
Master's appearing. And that is why we need to begin now to live the life because we really don't know when the Master is going to come. Song number 604. We know not the hour.
we don't know the hour. It is necessary that we lift up the banner of righteousness now, for Jesus Christ says, you know, blessed is that man when his master comes. Find him living right. Find him obeying. So, brother or oh sister, be faithful. Soon Jesus will come. Number 602. Oh, brother or oh sister, be faithful. church this is pastor sway checking in with you um now has come the time for us to spend a little bit of time in prayer so i would like to invite you right now to bow your heads so that we can pray pray for the prayer concerns would you let us pray kind heavenly father we are so grateful for how good you are and how much you love us i'm grateful lord for your leading in our lives uh we pray dear father that you continue to keep us safe, especially during this COVID-19. Uh, we pray to Father for those who have been affected by COVID-19, those who have been affected uh, with, by their health, uh, and those who have been affected economically, who actually work at businesses and are lacking work, or uh, their businesses are lacking um, 
the business that they're operating is also lacking. So I pray to Father that you might meet all of those needs. Father God, we also want to pray for Becky, who has just undergone surgery and is recovering right now. We thank you, Lord, that she made it through. Please be with her as she heals. We also want to pray, dear Father, for um, uh, for Vivian, okay, uh, and uh, because her uh, Anita's sister, Vivian, who was in an accident. And we also want to pray, dear Father, for the newly elected leaders. We are grateful, dear Father, that uh, they have accepted to serve, and we pray, dear Father, that you would work through them. We also want to pray, dear Father, for Murphy, uh, for her healing, uh, that she would continue to gain strength. And we also want to pray, dear Father, for the Schofield family who has uh, actually lost uh, a grandmother. We pray, Father God, also for Jennifer for healing and Venon for healing as well. And we also want to pray, dear Father, for all of those people who are affected by geoblastoma. We pray, dear Father, that you might provide the wisdom to the doctors to actually know how to heal that so that it would never affect the family ever again. We also want to pray to Father for Doug and Chor uh, Chuck and Dorothy and pray to Father for their healing as well. Uh, we pray for Kindy for healing for her as well. And we also pray for the McQueen family who uh, have lost their daughter, Diane. Uh, we continue to pray to your Father for the Cromer family um, and for healing in their family, dear Father, as they continue to mourn the loss of um, the father, grandfather, and father-in-law, uh, Bill Cromer. Uh, please, your Father, continue to bless our church. We pray, your Father, for the moving of your Holy Spirit, not only in our church, but in each one and every one of our lives. And we pray, your Father, that as we worship you, that you would continue to bless us, and that very soon, your Father, we could see your Son, Jesus Christ, come. Lord, this is our prayer, and we present it to you, dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad that we've been able to take the time to pray together. I pray that this will be something that you're practicing at home, right? Pray as a family. Uh, pray throughout the day. Take every moment to pray. I know God is going to continue to strengthen us as we are faithful in this task. May God bless each and every one of you. Little did I think when I composed this song about nine months ago for a friend of mine that it, it would relate so strongly to my own experience with COVID when I and my family came so close to death and all we had was our faith in God and our love for each other. In fact, it was my friend who sent this song back to me and said, Inskip, I was looking for a song to cheer you up. And none of them seemed to say what I wanted to say as this very song that you wrote. And guess what? That song ministered to me in my time of need. And so I'm hoping that as I sing it to you today, it will do for you what it did for me, what it did for my friend, and will give you hope and courage in Jehovah, your provider, your healer, and your God. In my dark moments of uncertainty and fear, I take comfort in knowing you, my God, are near. You've promised to be with me even in the valley, so I'm confident I match on. No Momentos de incertidumbre y temor, me conforta saber que tú conmigo estás, has prometido estar. 
estar conmigo aún en el valle de la muerte y por eso no te veré desde aquí hasta allí sana de mis dolencias mi guía y salvador amigo fiel you are here you take me there I will come through leaning trusting in you and we are just so grateful that God has seen your family through and has kept you uh, and returned you back to your position in ministry and so we're grateful for you and thank you to Pastor Elvis for highlighting the musical ministry of the HVA choir uh, we're gonna move right into our sermon topic for today and if you were on last week you heard uh, our Dr. Harrell present what was the first part of a two-part series, um, him highlighting personal failure, and this week we're going to dwell into the topic of corporate failure. And again, I just want to ask you to pray with me another moment. Our Father and God, thank you for being so good to us. As I enter your word right now, dear Lord, I pray for your spirit i pray for your words and not my words and i pray that you open our ears and that you open our hearts to receive what you have in store today for christ's name's sake amen so when i think about corporate failure the first story that popped into my mind when pastor asked me to present this topic was the story of enron and some of you out there listening right now are probably not old enough to remember Enron. And so Enron is an energy company. It starts in 1985. It starts after a merger between uh, Houston Natural Gas down in Texas and the Internorth Energy Company in Omaha, Nebraska. And Enron experienced tremendous growth as a corporation. Through the dot-com era of the 1990s, it grew from the small startup company to becoming the seventh largest company by market capital, capital in the United States by December 2001. And if you don't know what I'm talking about because you don't follow economics, currently today, the seventh largest company by market cap is a company called Alphabet. Some of you might know Alphabet because it is the parent company of Google. And so Enron was not small stuff. Enron became the largest company. It was named America's most innovative company seven years in a row, six years in a row by Fortune magazine from 1996 to 2001. The share rose uh, tremendously by the end of uh, the year 2000. And then at their peak of around $90 per share in September 2000, the company share slid to 26 cents per share by January 2002. That is a 99.7 loss of the company's value by the time this corporation failed 
and entered into bankruptcy. And so people who are studying the failure of Enron, they've identified three factors in its failure. The first factor being bad accounting practices. And so what was happening with Enron is that they were hiding losses in their books by creating other separate companies that were independent of Enron, these companies that they would call special purpose vehicles. And so on the books, they would show their profits and their debts and their losses. They will report through a different company that was unrelated to Enron. And so the shareholders only saw revenue. They misrepresented their profits and misrepresented revenue to their shareholders. And so with the quarterly reports, they would do things like report what they thought they were going to make or what they thought they should make in the future when they were issuing guidance rather than what they were actually making. Uh, they knew that there was poor corporate management and so every corporation has a board that's responsible for making sure that the corporation is practicing legally, ethically, and returning value. But the leaders of Enron uh, hid their financial misdeeds from the corporate board so they were unable to audit. And then the third thing is that there was no external accountability. Uh, those of you who remember the Enron scandal also know that the Enron scandal resulted uh, in the, the demise of Arthur Anderson, the, the accounting company, because in that environment of deregulation, Arthur Anderson not only signed off on all the cookbooks, but Arthur Anderson also shredded, literally destroyed the files when the government started investigating what went wrong with Enron. And so in the end, shareholders got their values wiped out, employee savings and their pensions were destroyed, and a lot of people went to jail. But like all good corporate crime, most of the high level officials who went to jail only served a short time because they made deals with the government and then they were free after a short while. But today we're talking about corporate failure and not about Enron. We we're going to take a look at the story of the Good Samaritan in the context of the topic corporate failure. And so I want you to turn, if you can, or use your device and turn over to Luke chapter 10 as we explore the story of the Good Samaritan. So the thing I want to emphasize about the story of the Good Samaritan is that the Good Samaritan story starts with a question about salvation. And so in verse 25, the scripture says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And even if we back up a little bit, we see that the chapter of Luke 10 is actually a beautiful chapter because it begins with Jesus sending the 70 out after he had selected these 12 disciples. He sends out 70. Uh, and in Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, it says this. He said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. And so the story is actually couched in the context of the sharing of the gospel and this question about salvation when the lawyer decides to test Jesus. And Elvis has already presented a profound breakdown of the Good Samaritan story. Uh, and, and I do not intend to try to go beyond or even into the level of detail that he did. If you reach out to him, he'll tell you exactly what day. I'm sure that the sermon is still here on this YouTube channel. But there are three key highlights that I want to point out in the story. One, the story becomes a story about who gets to inherit salvation. Two, the story really becomes a parable or an allegory around the spiritual and the philosophical definition of who is my neighbor. And three, the story exposes the hypocrisy of religiousness or the appearance of being religious versus Christ-likeness, which is that heart-like condition that compelled the Good Samaritan to stop and attend to the person who was in need. And again, when we think about the story and we see the priest and the Levite walk by this man, understand that the priest and the Levite depending on the direction 
that they were going to, they were moving from Jerusalem to Jericho, that was the road. But depending on the direction, they might actually be going to participate in religious ceremonies. And so the law gave them a full out so that they did not have to come in contact with a dead corpse um, in their period of cleansing. Now, that same law also provided them uh, with exceptions so they could attend to people who were dead and deceased, but they chose to use the law is what I imagine in their mind that says, listen, because I am clean, I cannot make contact with this corpse. Also, the lawyer, when he tests Jesus, he wanted to make the argument that, yes, my neighbor are really just people like me. And so when I think about what I should do, I should love the Lord my God with all my heart, my soul, my strength, and my neighbor as myself. The lawyer was trying to thread this thin needle of, I'm going to love my neighbor, but I'm going to specifically define my neighbor to, neighbor to exclude people who do not look like me. And so another way to think about the Good Samaritan story is Jesus sharing a Samaritan Lives Matter uh, story with the lawyer and with the Jews who believe that the Samaritans, even though they were relatives of the Jews, having descended from the northern kingdom when Israel split up, uh, they did not consider them equal in their humanity. But today we're not focusing on individual failures. We're going to consider the story of the priest and the Levite as representative of the corporate system that fails when we, when we start thinking about who is our neighbor. And I'm defining corporate failure as a thing that happens when traditions and rules and the outside appearance causes us to miss the suffering of our friends. And so as Lester shared last week, he talked in a beautiful sermon, if you did not watch it, you should today talked about his own experience in school and talked about that journey uh, from initial failure to being blessed with tremendous success. And so I'm going to have my own confession. And my confession is this. I consider my identity as a Christian to be core to every other aspect of my identity. I confess that I love the story of the gospel and I accept the story of the gospel as it is written. I find the gospel to be credible and I find the gospel to be incredible. I am humbled by the message of John 3.16 that says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And there's a song that pops into my mind as I think about John, John 3.16 by Aaron Shep that says my savior loves my Savior lived, my Savior is always there for me, my God he was, my God he is, my God he's always going to be. Additionally, I'm proud that I practice as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, not because I think I have some kind of special in through affiliation to get to heaven, but because I consider it a privilege to identify with the people who have an opportunity to share the unadulterated message of salvation to God's people as the final message to the world. But even though I'm proud to be a Christian, when I interact with people who do not identify with any faith tradition, I will tell you and confess that I often find myself reluctant to disclose that I'm a Christian early in a conversation, not because I'm ashamed of my Christianity and not because I'm ashamed of Jesus, because just like Paul says in Romans 1 verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel, uh, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And if I were ashamed of Jesus or the gospel, I probably wouldn't be sitting here broadcasting this message on YouTube for the world to see. But I will confess that I am often ashamed of who represents Christianity and how Christianity gets represented to the world, particularly through the eyes of the non-believers, and at risk, because I, I, I acknowledge my own hypocrisy, but I often want to lead by saying this, hey, I'm a Christian, but not that type of Christian. Because I think about corporate failure and I wonder, is it corporate failure when prominent Christian voices vilify and disparage of Muslim brothers and sisters because of their faiths? 
I wonder, is it corporate failure when Christians stand idly by as immigrant families and immigrant people are mistreated, are treated as subhuman, are caged in deplorable conditions, and are denied the basic dignity and basic rights that we would offer to a human being. I ask myself, are we failing as a corporate body if young people in our churches are attempting and completing suicide simply because of their sexual identities? And it strikes me in the story of the gospel that Jesus drew people to him, all kinds of people, the people who would have been excluded by society, the people who would have been disregarded by society. Jesus managed to draw people to him without fear that he was compromising the standards of the scripture or without fear that he was uh, misrepresenting the intention or the heart of God. And so as I reflect on corporate, corporate failure, I think about whose comfort are we prioritizing as Christians? And I think about whose discomfort are we willing to minister and whose discomfort are we unwilling to minister to? As I think about corporate failure, I ask myself, can we welcome our homeless brothers and sisters into our congregations without fear of making ourselves uncomfortable or worrying that someone in the gathering or in the fellowship will feel uncomfortable because we're ministering to our homeless brethren? As I think about corporate failure, I wonder, can our leaders speak out against injustices in our world without fear that someone in the congregation is going to feel uncomfortable. And the irony to me is that we serve a God who was literally tortured on a cross for our sins. We serve a God who did not regard his own comfort in his mission to seek and to save. And as I think about corporate failure, I think about how as a corporate body, Christians, and yes, Seventh-day Adventists, we continue to segregate ourselves weekly into congregations of people who look like us, who think like us, who vote like us. All the while we're singing, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Because these questions go straight to the heart of who is my neighbor? And so as we look at the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus was really intentional in verse 29 of Luke chapter 10, but he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? If as individuals in a corporate body, we are still taking the same approach of attempting to justify ourselves by limiting who we consider as our neighbor, then we might be experiencing corporate failure. And as I think about corporate failure, another story that comes to my mind is the story of Blockbuster Video. And some of you are too young to know about Blockbuster Video, but like Enron, Blockbuster Video was started in 1985. Its first story being Dallas, Texas, as opposed to Houston, Texas, where Enron started. Short story of Blockbuster Video is that people love to watch movies. And so it grew from one store to multiple stores and it experienced rapid growth through the 1990s. And by the late 1990s, there were over 9,000 Blockbuster stores in the United States. And some of you might have a hard time understanding like what that means in scope. And so let me just like put this in context for you. At the end of 2019, so in December 31st, there were 3,900 KFCs in the United States, about 5,800 Wendy's, and about 7,200 Burger King. So when I say there were more than 9,000 Blockbusters, Blockbuster video was everywhere. And I know that some of you are vegetarian, uh, some of you are vegan, and you are uncomfortable by that. And so I also looked at the NAD website um, that lists 6,377 Seventh-day Adventist congregations or individual churches across the United States and Canada, so the NAD. So there were more blockbusters than there were Adventist churches. Um, so Blockbuster grows and it is a video rental business. You go in, you rent your video, uh, you bring it back when you promise to, or else 
you get a late fee and uh, in one year Blockbuster had actually amassed 800 million dollars in profit due to late fees and so in 19, 1997 there was a man named Reed Hastings who decided to start a DVD by mail service and that little service was called Netflix. Some of you might be familiar with Netflix. So in 1999, two years after Netflix started, Blockbuster passed up an opportunity to buy Netflix for $50 million. Uh, and $50 million at the time was a steal considering that Netflix is currently worth $181 billion. So instead of purchasing Netflix Blockbuster, they partnered with a company called Enron. You might have heard of this company. It was an energy company. Uh, it happened to be named America's most innovative company in 1999 when they partnered with this idea to create a video on demand service. And so Enron and Blockbuster came up with this idea uh, or tried to mainstream this idea that instead of renting videos or DVDs, people are just going to like go on demand on their TV and rent this movie and two years later Blockbuster pulled out of this deal with Enron so that they could focus on running their actual stores because they were making money in their video stores. So fast forward to the story, uh, Blockbuster tried about five or six years later to start up their own video on demand service. By then it was too late. Netflix had already dominated the market both with DVD by mail and video on demand. And so Blockbuster went from having more than 9,000 stores to today there being one remaining location of Blockbuster in Bend, Oregon. And I checked last night and I hear that during this pandemic, the one remaining Blockbuster store is doing really well. Point being, there was massive corporate failure in Blockbuster. And where am I going with this? Here's where I'm going with this. 2,000 years after Jesus' interaction with this lawyer, we're still struggling to answer this question, who is my neighbor? We're still struggling as a corporate body with this conflict between the appearance of religiousness versus nurturing and cultivating the heart condition that compels us to radically love and radically serve our neighbors. And so it hurts my heart when I see us as a corporate body struggling for moral clarity, just the way the Quakers did in 1776, when their religion prohibited their members from enslaving human beings on the principle that all human beings are created equal and every human being is worthy of respect. And the Quakers did this in 1776, while other Christian denominations were using the same scripture to justify enslaving God's creation. As I'm going through this, I realize that this might be the last sermon I get to preach. Uh, thank you for asking me, Elvis. I, I understand if I never get asked to do this again. But I just want to close out with a few reflections on how do we avoid corporate failure? How do we avoid failing as a corporate body? Just a few points. Point number one, get to know Jesus anew each day. Fall in love with Jesus anew and fall in love with his word over and over. The word tells us that he renews his love to us each day. And to avoid corporate failure, failure, each of us has a responsibility to get to know Jesus anew each day. To avoid corporate, corporate failure, we've got to figure out a way to lose our blockbuster mentality. Blockbuster thought or assumed that the way that things work well for us in the past will continue to be the way that things work for us in the future. And so even the signs, even though the signs were there that we need to change our outreach, we need to change our model, we need to change the way that we engage with people, Blockbuster said, you know, this has been working really well and it's been really profitable. And that Blockbuster mentality led to their downfall. To change the corporate failure, we're called to de-emphasize our own comfort. So instead of reflexively reacting with 
I'm not really comfortable with this topic. I'm not really comfortable reaching out to this group. I'm not really comfortable with this ministry. If we ask ourselves, who's hurting and whose pain can I minister to? We can avoid corporate failure. And so as I speak, and as you are hearing my words today, our brother Tom Clark and his crew is out there finding a way to safely provide meals to our homeless population. As I speak, Dr. Agar and his colleagues uh, through their charity are finding ways to minister to families who are now struggling, particularly in the middle of this pandemic when people are losing their jobs. As I speak, just uh, reflecting that over the last several weeks, many of you in our congregation have been contributing to our needy family fund, recognizing that multiple families are in pain due to mass layoffs, due to mass unemployment, and the pain exists both within our church and outside in our community. As I speak, I'm grateful for those faithful members of our congregation, and I don't want to start call, calling names, but I could identify uh, our elder Abigail and Chuck uh, Petrowski uh, and our elder Hillary, who are faithfully calling members and checking on them, including our elderly members, our sick and our shut-in members. How do we avoid corporate failure? We expand our definition to the question, who is my neighbor? We avoid corporate failure when we're able to speak on behalf of someone else's pain. We avoid corporate failure when we are able to uh, take up a cause to minister to people's suffering, even though their suffering is foreign to the experience that I'm having. And by doing that, we're, we live the gospel definition of true religion found in James 1 verse 26 and 27, where 26 says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. And this one's religion is useless because pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So as we go into another week, as we reflect on the Sabbath on this idea of corporate fairy, I want to close by praying. I want to pray for those who in their hearts are sincerely asking God, help me not to be responsible for corporate failure through my actions, through my words, or through my inaction. I also want to pray for those who might have been offended by any of the content that I share with you today. I want to pray uh, because God is still working on our hearts and God is working on me as I speak, as he's working on you, that God will open our hearts so that unlike this lawyer, uh, we can expand our definition of who is my neighbor to allow us to continue to love, to continue, allow us to continue to serve, and to allow us to continue to minister to all of God's children just the way Jesus did. And so let us pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to spend these few moments in your word, these few moments reflecting on the power that you've given us uh, to share, uh, to love, uh, the power to bring about peace and the power to bring about healing in your world. Dear Lord, I pray that we do not miss opportunities that you would have taken in your ministry. God, I ask that you can help us to be your hands, to be your feet, and to be your heart in this world. Uh, God, I pray for everyone who's suffering, suffering because of this pandemic, suffering because of loss of employment, suffering, dear Lord, because of the pain of seeing people like them experience brutality, at the hands of citizens or at the hand of police officers. I pray for everyone who's suffering from despair, from discouragement. I just ask the Lord for your word to go throughout the world so that the end can come. We long to see you. We pray for salvation. 
all through Jesus Christ, our Lord, your Savior. So my son is a freshman uh, at HVA this year and uh, for us, for my wife and I, uh, our son's spiritual growth and his love for Jesus is the most important thing. We decided to put my son here because we really wanted to uh, have him involved in a uh, Christian environment. Uh, of course, you know, doing well in school, uh, being active and being in shape and uh, learning teamwork, learning how to become an adult are all important things and we feel strongly he can get all of that here at HVA. In a Christian school, often it seems like, you know, students aren't able to rise to a high professional level. But when we take a look at STEM, it opens up a world for them and gives them that hands-on approach that all of a sudden is that they start to imagine a little higher and a little bigger and thinking that wow, I could maybe rise to a higher field, so it's like working with NASA. He, we also decided to have him stay in the dorm, and we felt that this experience would help him grow as a person, being more independent. The campus is lovely and it's peaceful, and you can truly feel God's presence here at this school. Hi, I'm Pastor Cesar Graciotto and I'm the pastor here for the Highland View Church, located at the campus of the Highland View Academy. I would like to invite you and your kids to come and pay us a visit. We would love to meet you. We have a great staff with great spiritual life in the campus. Here at HVA, we think that it's so important that our students learn about relationships, friendships, romantic relationships, and how to have them appropriately. And so one thing that we do quite often is we engage in different social activities. We um, think that it's important to have fun, that life can be about having fun and learning how to do that with other people um, for the glory of God. Our church is totally focused in helping your kid to make a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. We are 100% Seventh-day Adventist-based education, and we would love to have your kid and your family being part of our family here at Academy Church. Greetings, and thank you for watching our programming today. I'm Chris Garrity, treasurer of the West Wilmington Seventh-day Adventist Church, and today's offering focus is on Highland View Academy. Since 1967, your conference boarding academy has been welcoming students from all parts of Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia to experience a Seventh-day Adventist Christian education. This education can transform a young person's life by encouraging a lifelong relationship with Jesus Christ and learning how to serve others in an ever-changing world. Your support is needed to continue this type of youth evangelism every year. Because of your support to these youth through your local church and conference students have been given scholarships to attend HVA. Can you believe over 60% of our students receive some support through these scholarships, such as the DeHaan Scholarship uh, or other scholarships through the Worthy Student Funds or academic, music, leadership, or sport scholarships. Students can also reduce their bill by their work in the ASSIST program. This program connects senior citizens and teenagers or jobs on campus or at the nearby DeVita Bakery. Your gift may affect one student from a church, multiple students from the same family, or a group of students from your own part of Chesapeake Conference. Each are helped because we all care, because you care. Any amount can make a difference in a young person's life. Would you give a sacrificial gift today to make it possible for a young person to attend HVA and transform their life through a Seventh-day Adventist Christian boarding education? Thank you for changing a young person's life today and really forever. And in closing, just a reminder to our community about ways that you can give to the West Wilmington Seventh-day Adventist Church and ways you can give to HVA. His most convenient method is to log on to AdventistGiving.org or you can mail a check or money order to our P.O. Box at 5241 Wilmington, Delaware, zip code 19808, or text or call me at 215-539-0245, and we can arrange a convenient pickup. And then in closing, may God continue to bless you as you work in his vineyard. Thank you.
The timeless theme, earth and heaven will pass away. It's not a dream, God will make all things new. I stumbled and fell. Evil is banished to eternal hell. No more night, no more pain, no more tears, never. Bow down to sing. The only sound is the praises to Christ our King. Oh.